My name is Dan Cochran, and uh, I'd like to introduce you, uh, Brother John Page, the president of Holy Cross College at Notre Dame, Indiana. Brother John came to Holy Cross College uh, after serving six years as the vicar and first general assistant of the Congregation of Holy Cross in Rome. A native of Albany, New York, Brother John has a long and distinguished career in Catholic education, including various positions from teacher, principal, and dean at such places as Holy Cross High School in Waterbury, Connecticut, Notre Dame High School in West Haven, Connecticut, the Holy Cross Novitiate in Waterford, New York, the Diocese of Albany, New York, Bishop McNamara High School in Forestville, Maryland, uh, Mac Makarare University in Kampala, Uganda, Queen of Apostles Philosophy Center in Jinja, Uganda, St. Edwards University, and he currently serves on the Board of Trustees of Stoneham College, Stonehill College, excuse me, and on the Board of Governors of the Holy Cross Institute at St. Edwards University. The recipient of numerous leadership awards, he is a past director and president of the National Association of Religious Brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to give you Brother John Page. They're going to put up a slide here in a second, so uh, while, while we're waiting, one, one of the credentials he forgot to say, that's because it wasn't in the script, is that I also live in the student dorm uh, at Holy Cross College with three other brothers. We have a small community right in the student dorm, so today I'm speaking as one of you. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to supervise the young men, the other 40 young men who, who live in the student dorm with me, but at the same time, I assure you I know that what 8 o'clock in the morning is when I go to the office. It's the quietest time in the dorm, absolutely. Uh, I don't need to say much about what else happens in the dorm at other hours of the night or day. Fortunately, most of the day I'm over in my office, so I don't have to deal with what they're doing during the day. And if the president lives in the dorm, they tend to be relatively good at night, actually. I, I will tell you that definitely. They're pretty good at night. I'm not sure what they do when they don't want to be good. But in the dorm, they've been good, so I'm counting my blessings. Of course, it's only been a year, so what can I say? I want to begin uh, with this quote. I know there's a lot of words up there. That's not what you're supposed to do as a pedagogue. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm hoping maybe this can be some instruction. This is the Constitution, Constitution 8 on the Cross from the Congregation of Holy Cross. And it's where the theme for this particular section of our presentation comes from. The Lord Jesus loved us and gave up his life for us. Few of us will be called to die the way he died. Yet all of us must lay down our lives with him and for him. If we would be faithful to the gospel, we, we must take up our cross daily and follow him. The cross was constantly before the eyes of Basil Moreau, whose motto for his congregation was spes unica. The cross was to be our only hope. And so that's what I want to speak about today, specifically the cross as our only hope. I'm happy to be here with you this morning, and I thank you for your participation in this Holy Cross pre-conference prior to the annual professional conference of the Association for Student Affairs at Catholic Colleges and Universities. Here at Notre Dame, you are at the geographical heart of our Holy Cross mission effort on this continent, the site of our first permanent foundation in North America. I am happy that some of your touring yesterday included Holy Cross Heritage Tours in the area, including where I minister at Holy Cross College, our youngest higher education foundation in the United States. I'm also grateful to continue your education in things Holy Cross by building on Bishop Jenke's thoughts on the history, character, and spirit of Holy Cross. To that end, I will consider this morning three objectives that may help us understand our ministry as Holy Cross educators, and in particular, as student affairs personnel in our colleges and universities. First, to understand the founder, Blessed Basil Moreau, and the personal relationships 
that underlie the legacy, the charism, he bequeathed to the congregation from his own personality and spirituality, especially his understanding of the cross. Secondly, to reflect and to understand a basic fact of human nature with respect to faith and the cross of Christ. And thirdly, to suggest how we as student affairs personnel in Holy Cross institutions might live in faith, the charism of the cross, our only hope in our current ministries. Basil Moreau was an engaging person. As a priest and professor at the Diocesan Seminary of Le Mans, France, his zeal for the apostolate was admirable and attractive. When he gathered some of his fellow priest professors to offer service to the local church in their free time, preaching, directing treats, spiritual direction, he attracted some of the best seminary students to this ministry as well. These men formed the first auxiliary priests of Le Mans. As a spiritual director and retreat master, he also gained the confidence of a group of teaching brothers, the Brothers of St. Joseph. Morrow eventually joined the two groups to begin what is now the Congregation of Holy Cross. Moreau was a hands-on founder and administrator, a fact that may have been a cause of his subsequent difficulties in governing the fledgling congregation as it expanded in membership, scope, and geography. He saw to the personal direction of the congregation's works, especially that of education. Moreau's insight was that an educational institution, as well as the congregation, must be modeled primarily on relationships. To that end, the example of the Holy Family of Nazareth, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, helped him articulate special characteristics of his congregation schools, like a family spirit, hospitality, respect for persons as individuals, and the special patronage and devotion to the Holy Family. A significant element of Moreau's personal spirituality was trust in divine providence. I would define that as the benevolent care exercised by God over the universe. This motivated him not only to accept human difficulties, that is the cross, but to embrace such struggles as the mean to conform one's life to God's will. Thus, Moreau saw all circumstances, even the frequently ununderstandable events of life, as part of God's good plan for us in the divine purview. Moreau's absolute trust in divine providence is well grounded in Scripture, especially in the letter to the Romans. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So for Basil Moreau, there is no fear. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He exhorted his fellow religious to live and act grounded in this faith belief and to embrace difficulties with as much fervor as they might embrace successes. This is his understanding of conformity to God's will. 
as informed and exemplified by his own life of faith. But Morrow's chief goal is even more profound. Not only should we conform our life to God's will and thus live like Christ, Moreau exhorts us to be Christ for others. To be Christ, in contrast to be like Christ, means to embrace the cross, including situations not of our own choosing, as Jesus did. This is to live in faith in the Son of Man. Here I want to take special note of the word embrace, which he uses so frequently. To embrace means to accept lovingly, zealously, intentionally. To embrace the cross, to carry the cross then, has profound implications for living our Holy Cross charism of the cross our only hope. I contend that this is easier said than done. So let me take a bit of time to reflect with you on the concept of carrying the cross. Understanding, at least from my perspective, a basic fact of human nature with respect to faith and the cross of Christ. To set the stage for a little reflection on this, I will quote extensively from a meditation on the cross by Sister Ruth Burroughs, a Carmelite nun in Quiddenham in Norfolk, England. She uncovers for us a subtlety about carrying the cross to which we as accomplished professionals and Catholic Christian adults may be blind. Bear with me, but I want to show this so you can follow. Deep within every human heart, unless it has been profoundly purified, there lurks a sly, unrecognized cunning, all too well skilled in self-deception and evasion. This is the total adversary of belief. It is the cunning of pride, of self-possession, of self-sufficiency. To fully live out of our inheritance, to live solely by the faith of the Son of God, to live the life of Jesus, all this may sound beautiful, and beautiful it is indeed, beyond our wildest dreams, but in practice it strikes a deadly blow at human pride. This is why so many of us, face to face in reality, with the self-dispossession that life in Jesus calls for, walk no more with him, not in the sense of complete desertion and denial of belief, but rather because they have said no to his cross, however many other crosses they may be carrying supposedly in his name. This first part of this meditation causes, gives me cause for self-reflection because I too catch myself supposedly carrying crosses about which I may have unending dialogue with the Lord, but which may not, in fact, be his cross. It is embarrassing. It is also quite human. It is easy to live unreflectedly in this regard, depending on our own limited talents and resources to carry the day and considering the frustrations we encounter along our self-directed path as crosses. We deceive ourselves if we consider this pattern to be what following the Holy Cross charism is meant to be. The reality of our human condition is more complex. Each of us has the choice either to live by faith or by flesh. To live by flesh is to live within the limits of our own potential, within the limits of our own perception and understanding, according to how things seem and feel, according to our natural experience. 
It is instinctive for us to live thus, taking for granted that our conscious experience is to be trusted, that it is the way things really are, the way we are, the way God is, that this is our life. We want to remain on this level because it is within our grasp. It is ours and affords a sort of security and assurance. This is so natural to us that we are unaware of how much of our life is lived from self, relying on self, and not on faith in the Son of Man. So, how can we hope to live the Holy Cross charism of the cross, our only hope then, if we are more than likely to be caught in the situation just described, relying on self and not so much on faith in the Son of Man. Don't despair, for we are in good human company in this situation. St. Paul discovers this inward struggle of human nature in his own following of Christ when he finds himself doing the things he does not want to do, though he knows better. We cannot rid ourselves of this deeply rooted pride and self-possession by our own strength. Only the Holy Spirit of the crucified and risen one can affect it, and this he is indeed always trying to do. But we must recognize his work and respond, amen. Hence, this topic, the Holy Cross charism of the cross, our only hope, can only be fully understood in the context of the faith life of our founder, Father Basil Moreau, and of our own faith life, such as it is, and such as it may become, as we allow the Lord to bring it to fruition by our own, amen. Let me try to apply this to our lives. How we as student affairs personnel in Holy Cross institutions might live in faith the charism of the cross, our only hope in our current ministries. Fortunately, Blessed Moreau was practical in giving his teachers solid advice on being educators in the faith. And I will attempt to do the same in this last section of my presentation for you. The pertinent question is, how might we as student affairs personnel be Christ and embrace his cross and thus live the charism of the cross, our only hope. In his work entitled Christian Education, Blessed Moreau gives this suggestion for a predilection with regard to students. If at times you show preference for any young people, they should be the poor, those who have no one else to show them preference, those who have the least knowledge, those who lack skills and talent, and those who are not Catholic or Christian. If you show them greater care and concern, it must be because their needs are greater and because it is only just to give more to those who have less, seeing in all only the image of God imprinted within them, like a sacred seal that you must preserve at all costs. For Moreau teaching and living with students and interacting with them is essentially about the relationship between being teacher and student, adult and young person. Teach young people first and then teach the subject. Live with your young people first and then remind them of the rules. Sometimes this maxim is articulated as a Holy Cross education philosophy. We begin where the students are. That is going to be a great surprise to you as it is to me in three or four weeks, where the students are. And like who our parents were, you don't get to choose that. 
They're coming, and we're there. Are there some crosses awaiting us? Now, all of us are aware that matters of educational philosophy can be one thing in theory and another in practice. Moreau recognized this reality too, and he articulates no less than 11 characteristics of students that can drive their teachers to distraction. Among them, you don't know any of these, among them he names students who are poorly brought up or spoiled by their parents, and students who are unintelligent, self-centered, opinionated, insolent, envious, without integrity, immature, lazy, or in poor health. Of course, in our Holy Cross colleges and universities, we have never encountered a cast of characters like that, have we? In my experience, all of the above human characteristics and many more are evident among the young people that we serve as student affairs personnel. And since it is our mission to serve all of our students, service to those students who present themselves to us and those students whom we identify or recognize as being at some risk can become the cross that is truly not of our own making or choice, but the one that needs to be carried by us. Embracing that cross, the person or situation that presents itself, whether conveniently or inconveniently, is key to living the Holy Cross charism of the cross, our only hope with selfless devotion, of which Morrow exhorts us. At Holy Cross College, we have a senior capstone presentation wherein the student reflects and recapitulates his or her learning experiences with particular attention to the desired learning outcomes of a Holy Cross education. The presentation is documented in an electronic portfolio, delivered in public in the presence of a team of internal faculty and external professional evaluators, and includes questions from the evaluators and the audience. Each semester when I prep the senior students for this experience, I emphasize that herein lies the opportunity to do your real inner work as an emerging adult Reflect on your experiences of life and learning. Identify your passion and talent. Articulate what you have learned and what you yet must learn to put that passion and talent at the service of others. And admit your own missteps along the way. I think this final category, documenting vulnerabilities and mistakes, is the most educative for the student and the most revelatory of the influence we as faculty or as student affairs personnel have in the lives of these young people. This past semester, one of the young women, a Canadian by nationality, described the current anti-religious milieu of Canada in her capstone, and particularly of her native Quebec province. While she had been raised in a devoted Catholic family, she became caught up in the persuasive sexual cult secular culture and abandoned her faith and religious practice as a teenager. She observed no alternative philosophies of life or practice in her schools or among her friends. A shooting massacre at her high school rocked her out of her complacency, and she began to search for meaning. At Holy Cross, as a philosophy major, she was inclined to take the contrary side in debates about truth, beauty, and goodness. However, over time, good teaching, the support of Christian community, 
and active religious practice of students and adults on campus gave witness to a Christian philosophy of life, which she eventually embraced wholeheartedly. The rose is her renewed commitment to the right to life. Praise to the faculty, campus ministers, dorm rectors, and fellow students whose patience and acceptance of her, despite her originally hostile attitudes about religious practice, brought a young woman back to the faith and to service of the church. Another young man, the youngest one among a family cohort of accomplished siblings, was afflicted with ADHD. He regarded himself as less than capable of holding an equal place in his family, and his social and academic history in secondary school seemed to confirm this. We took a chance at Holy Cross and admitted him to college studies. While he struggled, remaining on academic probation for two years, the patience of his teachers, the persistence of his writing center tutors, the encouragement of coaches and moderators of co-curricular activities helped him to gain enough confidence to believe in himself and to find ways to compensate for his disability. He graduated in May and is now gainfully employed in the company where he did his internship while a student. Praise to the faculty and tutors and coaches and writing center volunteers who would not give up on this young man even when he was ready to give up on himself. A third young man was an older undergraduate student. His college entrance was delayed for 10 years after high school graduation because he was undocumented, a Dream Act kid brought here by his family when he was two years old. An intelligent and highly motivated student, he was ineligible for any state or federal financial aid. Our service learning personnel met him at one of our local placement sites, the Holy Cross-sponsored Catholic parish here in South Bend, were impressed by his competence and zeal and began looking for ways to finance this young man's education. Through partnerships with parish staff members, college development personnel and donors, this man's financial needs were met. He graduated among the top students in his class. Praise the people on campus and off campus who work collectively for justice for young people in need. You have your own stories, of course, and any one of you sitting in this room could have been the support personnel that encouraged a student like these in their quest for maturity and growth. You do have those stories, and I hope that during our luncheon this afternoon you get to share similar instances when you have shown preference to students such as these. Young people need to realize that obstacles can be seen as opportunities. The cross, our only hope. Stretching their comfort zone can be a wonderful learning experience. The cross has hope in it. Even failure to utilize opportunities can be the foundation of a future plan for growth. The cross has hope in it. Faithful accompaniment, encouragement, our zeal, vigilance, seriousness, gentleness, and patience above all, but prudence and firmness as well. These are all qualities of those who would work with students and young people, according to Father Moreau. 
This is what we do. This is what you do every day in your life and job. And these are qualities that we must develop and practice to be Holy Cross educators and student affairs personnel who live the charism of Holy Cross. In faith, we believe that the work of God's hands is often accomplished mysteriously by the work of our hands. Our daily duties as student affairs personnel give us opportunities to embrace personal encounters and situations, whether convenient or inconvenient at the time, ways we can truly be Christ, as Moreau encouraged, carry his cross, as is the true charism, and live this Holy Cross charism of the cross, our only hope. I pray today that as we continue uh, with our interaction with each other, our relationships with each other, learning from those beyond our own cohort of, of personnel that came from our particular college or university, that we can encourage each other in this true ministry of the church, this certain ministry of Holy Cross. And as Bishop Jenke said, we are all educators, all Holy Cross educators in the faith. We have a particular way to do it. And I assure you, the cross is waiting for you. Three weeks, you'll have more than you can handle. But that's the point. More than we can handle allows the work of our hands to be the work of God's hands. Thank you.